Hey everyone, Cal here from Wise Guys Tutoring, and I'm back to solve questions number 6 through 10 for the MSAT 2020 math uh, specimen paper that's found online. Um, I'll remind you guys that I do offer private and group lessons for the MSAT math, so if you need to get in touch with me at WiseGuysUAE on Instagram, info at WiseGuysUAE.com if you prefer email. And yeah, without further ado, let's get started. Question six says, find the limit as X rightwards arrow three. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. So this is like a typo. So what we're supposed to take is that, that same thing on the Arabic side. So basically find the limit as X approaches three of F of X. Okay. And F of X is a piecewise function. So it's got two, two parts. It's like a compound function. So I took the liberty of graphing this. You do not need to, to have the graph, but I'm just going to put it up so that it's easier for you guys to visualize while we're, while we're discussing it. So the top part here is X squared plus three. So this is three, right? So bigger than three is X squared plus this and less than or equal to three is just Y equals X, which is this line here. Okay, so now how do we find the limit as X is approaching three? So whenever a limit exists, when you have two parts like this, what you're going to have to do is check two things. You're going to have to check the limit as X is approaching three from the left side. We call it three minus of this function F of X. And then you're going to have to compare that to the limit as x approaches 3 from the right side, like more than 3, of f of x. And what that looks like is this. When we're doing f of x and 3 is just a little bit, you can think about this as like 2.9 to 2.99 to 2.99999. Just it keeps approaching 3 from this, from this side, okay? So it's getting closer to three from the left side. And we know that when it's less than three, less than or equal to three, it's actually this part, this function, which is y equals x. So f of x in this area, f of x equals x. So it's limit as x is going to three minus, like approaching from the left of x. And in this case, for this limit, you just substitute the three in there. So this is going to be equal to 3. Okay, now let's check when we're approaching from the right side. So 3 plus means 3.11, oh, sorry, 0 0.00001, which is just a hair above 3. And when you're just a hair above 3, we're actually in this part here, right? We're actually in that part there. So when we're just above 3, f of x actually turns into x squared plus 3. And what does that equal when I do the substitution? You put the 3 in here, you get 3 squared plus 3. This is 9 plus 3, that is 12. Now, here's the problem. For a limit to exist, approaching from the left and approaching from the right must have the same limit. And over here, I can tell they are not equal. So because they are not equal, we have to say that the limit does not exist, okay? When you have a big discontinuity like this, there the limit will not exist, okay? It would exist if there was a hole, like if this was connected and there was a hole here, right, a, a value of y that's undefined, then we could still find the limit because it would be the same if you think about it. It would be approaching from here or approaching from here they would both be approaching the same value. This limit would exist. This one would exist. Limit would exist. But because we have a, a big discontinuity, right? We don't have that part. I just, I just drew it for us. We have actually a big, big discontinuity here. The limit approaching from the left and approaching from the right are different. If they are different, it does not exist. The limit does not exist. And when I say three minus, that means approaching from the left. That means like, 2.9999 kind of thing. And this one is the opposite. It's approaching from the right. It's like 3.00001. And when you're dealing with a function like this in two parts or more, then you have to be careful what you substitute f of x for, right? So if we're just under 3, you have to use the one that's just under 3. And yeah, if you're above 3, then you have to go to that other one. Uh, that's what determines how you find the limit. Uh, okay, so I hope that's clear. We'll move on to number 7. 
Question 7 says, what is the x-coordinate of the point of intersection for the two equations shown below? Uh, y equals x squared minus 2x minus 5 and y equals x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x minus 9. So, intersection, whenever they're talking about an intersection between two equations, what that means is that these two will have the same x-coordinate at the same time that they have the y-coordinate. So algebraically, what that means is that, you know, equation one or curve one will be equal to, to curve number two. So this is how you find it. You equate them. You say, when is the intersection? Well, it's when this one is equal to this one. So if you equate them like this and you manage to solve for the x value that makes them equal y, then you have found the intersection right this is a system of equation it's a simultaneous equations kind of thing where we want uh, a pair of x and y that is the same in the top equation as it is in the bottom equation the way that you find it is since this is equal to y and this is equal to y the way you find it is you just equate them you equate them and you solve so um as always with these, you know, quadratic or, or cubic functions, what we're going to try to do is get everybody on one side. So I'm going to try to move everybody over to the, to the right side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract an x squared. I'm going to add 2x. And I'm going to add 5. What happens is these all cancel out, right? Because I'm using the inverse operations. And then I get x cubed minus 3x squared minus 3x minus 4 right now this is a cubic function when I, I say cubic because it's to the x cubed is the highest power the highest order and the way that we're going to solve this when is it equal to zero is by trial and error okay there are several techniques that will narrow down your options of what will work what values of x will make this equal to zero there are some techniques but normally at this stage you won't need anything too fancy just start with zero one two three uh, and hopefully by three or four you'll have found the value of x that makes this equal to zero okay so right now of course i'm going to start with x equals zero and when x equals zero if you put that in that means it's zero zero cubed right which is zero minus zero minus zero minus four so when x is zero this is equal to four so that one's no good x x equals zero is no good let's see what happens when it's equal to one so that would be one cubed minus three times one squared minus three times one minus four and if you put that in your calculator you're gonna get negative nine which is also not zero so that one's also no good i'm gonna try to see it's trial and error and it's not so bad because the numbers are not not huge or anything you can manage to do this uh, if you get to like three or four and you still haven't found anything then you should probably try something else so if you put this in your calculator you get uh, eight minus uh, 12 minus six minus four so you end up with minus 14 which is also not good so let's see what happens when x is three are we getting any closer three cubed minus three 3 squared, so these cancel out, and then 3 times 3, that's 9, minus 4, this is minus 13, also not, here we go, I have a good feeling about 4, I have a good feeling about 4, wink, wink, so 3 times 4 squared, minus 3 times 4, minus 4, lo and behold, it's 0, okay, so the x coordinate, where they both meet, is going to be 4, and I can check that, right? Let's do a quick check. If if 4 is correct, that means when x is 4, these guys should, should both equal the same y value. Um, so when I put 4 in the top one, okay, for equation 1, when I put x is 4, I get 4 squared minus 2 times 4 minus 5. That's 16 minus 8, which is 8, minus 5. That's 3. Let's see if it's the same for the second equation. So you get 4 cubed minus 2 times 4 squared minus 5 times 4 minus 9. So this is 64. 64 minus, that's 16 times 2, that's 32. So 64 minus 32 is 32. Minus 20 is 12. Minus 9 is 3. So you see, when x is equal to 4, y is equal to 3. 
this is the point where they intersect. For us, they're only asking for the Y coordinate. You didn't have to do this, but this is a good check. In fact, I've taken the liberty of uh, graphing these two to show you where the intersection is. So here it goes. The point of intersection, as we had previously said, is when X is equal to four and Y is equal to three, right there, right? That's Y is three and X is four, okay? So our answer, our answer is correct. The X coordinate of this intersection point is four. And the way that we found it is by equating the two. Okay, when you have it y equals to something, y equals to something, and somebody tells you they where do they intersect, just equate them. Equate them and solve for the value of x. Once you find the value of x, you can plug it into either one to get your value of y. And as I just mentioned, when you put the x value in either one, it should give you the same y, right? Because they both touch at the same point. Uh, I don't know if it's clear here, but this one is the, f the first equation. This is y equals x squared minus 2x uh, minus 5, and that blue one there is y equals x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x minus 9. Okay, let's do number 8. Uh, this one says find the least common denominator LCD between 7 12th and 11 18th. So uh, basically we're just going to focus on the denominators, right? So you have 12 and 18 and I'll show you two ways of doing this. Uh, when they say lowest common denominator, we can also call that the lowest common multiple between these two denominators. So your first step is to break these down into their prime factors and you do it like this. You just break it up into two numbers that multiply to give you 12. For example, 2 and 6. And whenever you come up with one number that's prime, what you're going to do is circle it like that right prime prime is a number that is only divisible by itself and by one so the primes are like 2 3 5 7 11 13 17 19 etc so 2 is a prime and now 6 we have to break it up again into two numbers that multiply to give me 6 so you got 2 and 3 so 2 is a prime and 3 is also a prime so that means we can't break these up anymore and we are done that means that 12 can be broken down as a product of 2 times 2 times 3. And sometimes we like to write it in the exponent form. So there's two twos, that's 2 squared times 3. Okay, let's do the same for 18. So for 18, let's say that's 2 and 9. You know, whenever I think it's a pair number, I, I like to start with it with a 2. So 2 is there. And then the 9 we can break up again, right? It's 3 and 3. And those are primes as well, so I'll circle them. And now we, we've broken up 18. So 18 is 2 times 3 times 3, which is 2 times 3 squared. So now that I've broken them up into their prime factors, this is how you find the lowest common multiple, the lowest common denominator. You're going to take the highest version exponent, the highest power of each available number. So we have twos and we have threes. So we need to take the two highest powers. So the highest power of the twos is the two squared. And the highest power of the threes is the three squared. So this is 4 times 9, that's 36. So your answer is going to be 36. Um, I'll show you another way of doing this, which some people prefer. Okay, let's put two circles here. Let's call these, one of them is 12 and one of them is 18. So once you've broken them down into their prime factors, what you can do is this. We'll put the prime factors of 12 and 12. And we'll put the 18 prime factors over here. So you have 2, 3, and 3, right? What you're going to do is this. When you have a common number like this 2 and this 2, they can go together and you put them in the middle. This 3 and this 3, for example, they can go together right there in the middle. And if you're trying to find the lowest common multiple or lowest common denominator, then you just take whoever is left and you multiply them together. So who's left? are these numbers, right? And if you notice, it's the exact same thing. 2 times 2 times 3 times 3, which is 36. So you can do it using this Venn diagram thing. But either way, you need to do the breakup. You need to do the, the prime factors breakup, okay? While we're on the subject, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to find this other thing. So, so what we found here, this is called the lowest common multiple or if we're talking about denominators, they, they will call it least common denominator. 
uh, lowest common denominator, so it's fine. Same thing. There's another another thing that we can find is called the highest common factor. Uh, the highest common factor is the biggest number that both of these will be divisible by. If we're looking at this Venn diagram way, then the HCF or GCF, sometimes they call it the greatest, greatest common factor. So greatest common factor is just 2 times 3. It's just the numbers that you have in the middle. So the highest common factor, the greatest common factor is 6, which means that both of these are divisible by 6. That's the biggest number that you can divide 12 and 18 by cleanly. If you're going to do this, you actually do the opposite of the lowest common multiple. What you do is you take the lowest versions possible of anybody there. So the lowest version of the 2 is just 2 and the lowest version of the 3 is 3. When I say lowest version, I mean like the lowest power, right? If you're comparing the 2s, then this one is the highest power. You use it for the LCM. This is the lower power because when you don't see it, it's just 1, right? And this one is also 1. So if you're looking for the HCF, you always take the lowest power one. And if you're looking for LCM, then you always take the highest power one, okay? That's how you do it there. If you prefer to use this Venn diagram, uh, version then then by all means go ahead you know me I, I always like to give you as many tools as possible and you can decide which one works best okay let's do number nine so question nine says what is the inverse of the function shown below f of x equals 3x minus 5 so first of all what does it mean an inverse function uh, I'll explain to you as simply as I can let's say this is the original function and let's say instead of x I'm trying to find um, f of 3 like when x is 3 what's the functions value what's the y value so we say 3 times 3 minus 5 so this is equal to 9 minus 5 which is 4 okay the inverse function which we represent by f prime f apostrophe is basically going the other way right the original one when i put 3 in it it gave me 4 the inverse function means when i put 4 in it i get 3 back okay that's what inverse functions uh, they do Okay, the, I guess, formal definition you can say is f of the inverse function of x gives you back x. And this kind of a, a complicated way of to say that they undo each other. Okay, this function and the inverse function, they undo each other. Just like we talk about in algebra, how multiplication is the inverse of division, so they undo each other. And addition is the inverse of subtraction, so they undo each other. Uh, just the same, the function and the inverse function are opposite or inverse of each other so they undo each other okay so enough of that let's just figure out how to find it okay when you have f of x equals 3x minus 5 your first step is change f of x into variable y just for ease of you know notation and then what we like to do is change these variables so where y was y i'll put x and x turns into y like so, and then you're trying to get y all alone, so then it just becomes simple algebra, right? So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna add five to both sides, right? This one goes away, so now I have x plus five equals three y, and to get y all alone, since he's being multiplied by three, I do the inverse, which is dividing by three, so that these two undo each other, and now I have y equals x plus five over three, which of course is going to be A. So you notice the notation that I used was apostrophe, but another notation is F to the minus one of X. It's the same thing. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one. Question 10 says, what is the most general antiderivative of the function shown below? And it says G of X equals one plus X plus X squared divided by square root of X. So first of all, when we're talking about uh, doing integrals, antiderivatives, which are I'm going to call integrals, you do not want any x's in your denominator when possible, okay? And we also do not like roots. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to use our knowledge of indices, of exponents, in order to solve this. So first of all, when we have 1 plus x plus x squared divided by square root of x, I need to change this, okay? I don't want it to be in my denominator. So first thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the root. The root as an exponent, a square root as an exponent is one half. Okay, 
Um, if you don't know the expo the indices rule, I'll put a link up there to a video where we did the question on, on, you know, we discussed these rules, which are really, really useful. So square root can be converted to an exponent of one over two. And I do not want it in the denominator. So I want it to be in the numerator. So if I'm dividing by X, uh, to the power of one over two, it's actually the same as multiplying by X to the minus one over two. So bringing it up to the numerator makes it a negative one over two. So actually G of X can be rewritten now as X to the minus one over two times that, uh, you know, the previous numerator. Okay, so that's step number one is to convert this. We don't want to deal with a denominator and we don't want to deal with the root. It's much, much easier like this and I'll show you why. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to distribute this, this X to the minus one half. He's going to multiply everybody. And again, you're going to have to have a, a decent knowledge of your, your exponent rule. So again, if you haven't yet, check out that other video. So X to the minus one half times one is still X to the minus one half. And when you multiply x to the minus one half by x, the exponent here is one. Since they have the same base, when you multiply them, you add their exponents. So this becomes plus x to the one half. And lastly, you, again, it's the same thing, right? They have the same base of x. So when you multiply these two, you have to add their exponents. So minus one half plus two, that's x to the three over two. Okay, so G of X can be rewritten. This whole thing can be rewritten like this. And the reason I want to do that is so that I can bust my integral power rule. Okay, and this is the power rule. If you have X to the, let's say, N. Okay, I'll give the general form now, DX. If you have this, then it's always going to be the same. It's always going to be X to the N plus 1. So you increase it by one and then you divide by n plus one. Okay, so what you do is you increase your exponent by one and then you divide by this new number exponent plus one. So if I was to give you a numerical example, it would be like this. Let's say I'm looking for the integral of x squared dx. This is going to be equal to I increase the exponent by one, so it's two plus one, which is three. Well, I'll put two plus one, and I divide it by two plus one. And as always with undefined, you know, no limit integrals, you always have to add the integration constant c. So this is x cubed over three plus c. So now that I have them, you know, it's all x to the power of something, I'm just going to bust that same power rule, the integral power rule to these guys. And then I'm just going to get my answer pretty quick. So let's go ahead and do that. Maybe we'll use light blue. So if I say what's the integral, the general integral of g of x with respect to x, that's what that one means. I'm going to do the power rule to each one of these guys. So I'm going to say the integral of x to the minus one half plus x to the one half plus x to the three over two dx. I'm going to take them one by one and I'm going to bust my rule, right? So I'm going to increase this one by one and divide by my new exponent. So this gives me x minus one half plus one is one half. And I have to divide by that new exponent, one half. Here you get x so one half plus one is three halves or 1.5 and you divide by three over two same thing again i'm going to add one so that gives me five over two over five over two and of course we can't forget our integration constant now i can clean this up a little bit okay this is a, a typical fraction thing when you're dividing by a fraction it's the same as multiplying by the inverse of that fraction so if i was to just give you a quick note here on the side. Uh, it's like saying X divided by three quarters. Well, this is the same as saying X times four over three. Those are, those are the same. So all I'm going to do here is multiply by the inverse of this. So multiplying by the inverse of this, I'll get X to the one half times two over one, which is just two. Similarly here, when I divide by three over two, it's like multiplying by two over three. And lastly, of course, 
this will be the same as multiplying by 2 over 5 x to the 5 over 2 and we got our good old-fashioned integration constant so where is the answer which one of those no 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 well it's going to be this guy and there is no integration constant here and I suspect that's because they've asked us for the most general antiderivative so this is the general one so that'll be your answer the third one C if you like so that's it for this video it was pretty heavy uh, with a little bit of calculus with the limits and the integration and stuff but uh, hopefully you guys caught on uh, please do make sure to to check out those links I put up in case uh, you're not familiar with some of the techniques that I'm using there because it'll be really helpful uh, I also do give private and group lessons for the MSAT math so uh, hit me up on Instagram at wiseguysuae if you want to inquire about that and uh, please do subscribe to the channel and make sure you like the video anything you guys need just leave me a comment there in the comment section questions suggestions and i'm happy to get back to you uh, i'll see you guys in the next video soon thanks